It is one o'clock on the dot. Good afternoon from the 104.5 The Zone Studios. I'm Jackson Williams. Breaking news out of Vanderbilt as they are expected to hire James Madison head coach Mark Byington. Byington led JMU to the NCAA tourney with a 32-4 and record this season. JMU knocked off Wisconsin in the first round before losing to Duke. The NFL annual owners meetings taking place in Orlando this week, and it is already announced that they are banning the hip drop tackle in a unanimous vote by the competition committee. More news to come out of the owners meetings as the week progresses in a huge trade for the Titans over the weekend, acquiring cornerback Legereus Sneed from the Chiefs for a 2025 third round pick and a swap of 2024 seventh round picks. The contract aspect, which was what this held this trade up initially, was also agreed to signing a four year $76 million contract with $55 million guaranteed. This is all pending a physical. For all your foundation repair and waterproofing needs, you need to visit USSTN.com. Breaking news at once on your home for the Titans and Vols. This is 104.5 The Zone. What's up, everybody? Happy Monday on Blaine and Mickey. Did you get, get your basketball fixed this weekend? 325, 3 for 25 from 3 for the Vols. Did that... Did that give you your basketball fix for the weekend, Bananas? I Boy. don't think I've ever watched as much basketball in my life as I did this weekend. Because we had Thursday off, we had Friday off, I had Saturday, and I had Sunday. <laughs> Bananas maxing and relaxing. Oh, man. I watched every single game except one. There was one game I didn't watch, and it was... Uh, Marquette, Colorado, Saturday morning. Okay. Or, or Sunday morning, sorry. Blaine Bishop, did you watch that much basketball? Absolutely not. <laughs> okay. I mean, no. I'm, I'm watching the one that I am going to be talking about. Okay. It really matters, and that was Tennessee. So, uh, yeah, yeah, you know. Yeah, I, I can't sit there that long. You know, my back may get stiff now. <laughs> watching all that basketball. Hey, I love me some basketball being an Indiana guy, but uh, – now, I'm only interested, as I said before, in my bracket. I have Tennessee winning it all. I think they're going to go on a run. They won this way in unconventional fashion. And when I say that, I'm talking about they couldn't drop, uh, you know, nothing in the bucket, really. But their defense carried them. Their role players actually stepped up. Vescovi, some steals here or there. James made some critical shots uh, along the way. Naturally, Adu and Ziegler kind of struggled a little bit throughout the game and, and Connect was not connecting. Mm -hmm. I said this was going to happen in the tournament and the role players got to uh, Awaka was a contributor that helped out James contributing. Uh, so I, I thought that's how they won a game, but they really won a game by, based off defense. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, that was a coin toss game and made some critical free throws there at the end. Adu, Connect. I mean, so Got to get them credit. They find another way. Good teams find other ways to win. Uh, that's why I'm uh, supporting them and think they can. But they, they can't think they're going to, you know, not <laughs> shoot, I mean, like that and think they're going to advance. You know, teams are going to be a little bit better. So continue to grow. Get some confidence. They kept shooting. I thought Connect was uh, rushing his shots and pressing a little bit. Uh, and I think the team leaned on him too much when he wasn't connecting and should have started running just their regular normal offense and not looking for him. Mm -hmm. And sometimes he came down to just do one pass and he was shooting. So I, I, didn't, I didn't like that at all. So when you're not hitting buckets, you take the ball to the bucket. It's real easy and simple. Keep everything uh, simple for your guys. So once he went to the bucket, then it started opening up a little bit more for everybody else with the backdoor cuts. He was getting dunks. Uh, so, you know, it just wasn't one of those pretty games uh, that you like watching. But you say, OK, we earned that one. Now, hopefully, what is this? How many games in now that they've kind of struggled offensively in what, three games or so? So you hopefully at some points, two weeks that, you know, that doesn't continue because they, they won't advance. But I, I think they got a great shot, man. They they stepped up. The, the role players stepped up when they needed it because you got to know connect is not going to always be like that high efficiency Type player, even Ziggler wasn't hitting shots, so that was yeah. a that was tough for for me to to watch because they really needed him. I think he started pressing, doing a lot of one on one ball. I don't like that. Uh, so at least do some pick and roll type stuff and get other people involved, and maybe they double down and everything like that. But uh, yeah, they came away with a hard earned uh, 
you know, win. And, uh, hey, man, tip the cap to uh, Barnes and his staff. And, uh, man, they move forward. So, yeah, man, I'm, I'm excited because at some point you just know how the basketball gods work. You, the lid's not going to be on the basket forever like this. So, and they're still winning. That's a positive thing when you look at as an athlete because you look back at this game and go, man, we shot horrible and you still won. Oh, my. Oh, the, the pressure's off now. So just imagine if they lost this game, everybody would be talking about, see, that's what nobody's thinking about, connect, not connecting. That's what they would be talking about. So that's when you, you know, that's why I talk about in, you got to win games as a team, mm-hmm. even though you have the star player, because you just never know where he may have a bad night. Uh, so I, I was really excited about what I'm seeing and looking forward to, you know, how they match up against Green, who uh, won in double overtime. Was it double overtime? Yeah, so, uh, and it's a good team, but they don't have a big rotation. They only have six, maybe seven guys right. that they use. So, you know, a lot of coaches think that doesn't matter, especially they stay in the rhythm. But if they get in foul trouble or you go up and down a lot, which they can, Tennessee can do beat you any kind of way you want them, mm-hmm. uh, it's, it can become an issue down the stretch. Uh, so playing extra minutes always matters to me, even when you're a young buck. Talked about role players. Tobey Awaka, 10 points and five yep. rebounds in 11 minutes. minutes yep. Golly. He, got and yeah. he would have played a lot more if he wasn't in foul trouble. Mm-hmm. R- really? <laughs> what? 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 <laughs> what? <laughs> what? <laughs> he would have been a more of a major contributor yeah. if he okay, didn't get yeah, in foul yeah. trouble. I, I know what you meant, but it's the way you said it. But uh, so, yeah, yeah, he, he, was, he was phenomenal. He was the key, really. To uh, getting him over the snide, uh, really, and one of those role players that contributed. So masterful move by by Barnes and crew, even though he got in foul trouble. But he, man, those ten points were very valuable in a low scoring game. And it wasn't just it, like the re, the the rebounds Second he shots. was getting. Mm-hmm. Like he he it, they weren't easy. He was going up and taking the ball out of Texas players' hands. He was fighting, and I he injected to me some energy into the team off on the boards, and I think it showed everybody else like, hey, I know we're Lids on the basket right now, but we're we're fighting through this just like Tobe is. Yeah, he was giving them second shots and they still was missing them. Like, I saw one connect in. Yeah. I was like, dang, they were wide open. That was like a free throw, even though it's a three. But I mean, compared to what they were getting, it was like, oh man, this is, oof, it was tough. And you talk about Zakai, the the lid kind of being on the bucket for him as well. He found other ways to affect that game. Well, of those, course, some he's of a those point guard, some yeah. of those passes he made. I don't yeah. think I've ever seen. Someone in recent history at, at Tennessee that could pass the ball that he, like he does. I'll tell you, the other giant that got woken up in that game a little bit was one. Triple J. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's what I said. James, he was, I said he was the guy. I mean, he put up, what did he put up, eight? Or yeah, nine points. points. Yeah, yeah. He, so. Like you said, shots aren't falling. He attacked the rim. He you went to the attack. paint. That's a big body dude, man. Yeah, yeah. They, the, him and Awaka, the, the, the role players are going to play because I, I try, try to tell you – Connect is not going to be on fire every game like he was pretty much the entire season. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that, 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 that's, that was very rare. So, so if he could at least get his uh, average, which is 21 points, regardless of how they come, mm-hmm. uh, because shooters keep shooting even when you're not making them. You keep shooting them. So you don't want to go one for nine. You want to go three for 17 because I'm going to keep firing because eventually they go in great shooters. They, 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 they don't ever lose their confidence in their shooting ability. And that's why I said I thought he was more, you know, it looked like he was more aiming because he wanted to go in because he hadn't hit one. And then he finally hit one, I think, what, in the second half there? Yeah. I thought that was a turning point, too, to be honest, because he got the lid off the basket. You could tell the fans there who were Tennessee fans, you, you could tell they was excited about the, <laughs> him making that three because uh, he was right there on point, all of them. It's just a matter of it falling, you know. So, yeah, I'm, 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 man, I'm, I'm pumped, man. But, uh, boy, this crane team, boy, they're a little dangerous. So, yeah, ooh. Yeah, they shot uh, almost a thousand threes this year. They shot like a hundred and thirty more threes really? than Tennessee did. Well, oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, they shoot the ball lights out, and they were shooting it lights out against Oregon too. Oh well, well th- I'm glad you guys said that. Th- this is going to be a tough game for Creighton. Then that they're not going to th- Tennessee plays defense mm-hmm. like no other team that's actually in the tournament, and so they know, especially with them not hitting baskets until they start seeing the ball go in the basket, they're going to continue to ratchet up their defensive side. No no doubt about it. Especially playing a team that, that scores like that. Yep. Ooh, yeah, they got to get after them. Make their legs real weary. They they play the, you know, granted it's going to be a week. But uh, so, yeah, you got to get after them. And if they keep dropping them, you got to know one half is one half, but the mm-hmm. second half could be another another half. 
you know, especially shooting teams like that. Wow, they shot. Oh man, they shot nine hundred and ninety-five threes wow. this year. Dang. So they live and die by the three, then. And Tennessee shot like eight hundred and sixty-five. Yeah. So they live and die by it. Now they also have the seven one guy. The big guy he's funny. Like he's not he's not one of these super explosive, just freak athlete guy. Yeah. He, he moves well, his he feet. Have to be. He's tall. He moves his feet great. And he always seems to move his feet and get himself in a position to he affects everything. He's he's fun to watch. The bat- he, is he just a post player? Or no, he, he, he's shot over fifty threes this year, made a third of them. Oh no. The battle between him and Jonas Adu is going to be an interesting one. Depending on which Jonas Adu shows up this week or, or on Friday, yeah. Car- what do you mean, which Jonas Adu? The the Jonas Adu that gets down in the paint and uses his body and and works it, and the Jonas Adu that takes five shots because he can't get anything working down there. So do you, when you look at Adu, do you look at who he's competing against and how well he does? Because you can go game to game and say that. Uh, you know, like he may have a good game because he feels like, oh, it's Creighton and I should be able to do well against them. Oh, we're going against Texas. They have some guys as a high flyer. It's a little bit more intimidating, uh, and he doesn't do as well. We could talk about how they want to feed him, but they they, yeah, they so, need to start feeding him more too, by so, the way. Oh, yeah. So Man. last week, remember when I looked it up, and the games against teams that had decent big, so the games against decent. Purdue. No, the games against like Purdue and uh, or UNC, those are the games he struggled, struggled right, uh, right, right. against the against the decent bigs. And we looked, remember, he was only getting like four, getting five, attempts. six shots. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And you, so, yeah. so, see, see if, here, here's one thing people don't understand when you with the bigs. You, that's why when you made that statement, it made me say, but they gotta feed them. Mm-hmm. So if you keep the big engaged. And then I'm talking about coming down and just keep feeding him like he's Patrick Ewan back in the day or some Akeem Elijah one. But I'm saying, hey, every, you know, 10 or so series, make sure he gets a touch. Stay as involved, even if he's not, you know, for him, but he's involved in the game and feels like he has a presence. Uh, that matters to those big guys because they don't need a lot of touches, mm-hmm. especially a guy like him is kind of a, you know, a big that uh, doesn't get the ball a lot. Like the focal point is not him. Right. Uh, so, yeah, I think they keep him involved and engaged. I think they'll be fine. I think they'll be fine, man. I, yeah, you, everybody knows me. I, when I pick, I believe. I believe they can get it done. And then, you know, what is this, the first time they were back-to-back Sweet 16s? Or no? Or for a while? Uh, this is back-to-back Sweet 16s. This is only the second Pearl, one under maybe? Barnes. So, yeah, oh. so it, it had obviously yeah, been there. So. Because Barnes been there they, since 2015. They did it back in 2008, Seven, I believe. Eight. Okay. 2007, 2007, 2007, 2008, they went back-to-back Sweet 16s. Okay. That's yeah, yeah, 2024, so it's been a minute. Yeah, so I think, man, I, man, I think they can. I think, boy, this is going to be a good one, boy. Defense versus offense? Ooh. Hey, we, we had this discussion about Tennessee. Ooh. We had a guest on. And, by the way, Mike Wilson's going to join us next. And we were we finished that segment. We came back, and it's like, man, what if they have a game where they just can't shoot anything? Mm-hmm. Which happened. And the discussion, I think you pushed it this way, was, hey, man, if you're them, you play good enough defense. You can overcome. They scored 62 points and won in NCAA against Texas. So it's Dylan DeSue. They got guys who can yeah. score the ball. They smothered them. 17 turnovers. Uh, Tennessee went down into the paint, like you said, when they couldn't – they scored 36 points in the paint. Mm-hmm. Uh they showed what they can do with that old school Barnes defense. Because yeah. Barnes' thing is, we can take this and unpack it anywhere and be competitive. Yeah. That's how. That's, that's what why I the love this team, though. Yeah, because they can also get up and down and score. Usually, they're his teams usually can't do that. Right. So we can beat you anyway. We have a bad shoot night. Hey, we're gonna have lock it down. So that's why I think they can go on this run. So this one's gonna be a really good test. I'm a, I'm excited, man. You got to be excited if you Tennessee fans that you got a great shot. You know, until you play, then it's what nine fifteen game here. Oh yeah, you're going. Which to... is ten fifteen their time, which is the time they're on. Yep. I know a lot of people laugh when I say stupid stuff like this, but it matters to me. How many times did you play at ten fifteen? <laughs> did you start a game at ten fifteen? Uh, how many times did you finish a game at ten fifteen? I never even finished a game at ten fifteen. Maybe one tournament game in a district tournament. And, and that's just assuming the game before them goes on goes time. On, right. It goes yes. That's, that, that's that, best that, case so scenario is 10 15. If that yeah. game goes into overtime or there's a lot of fouls and it takes a while in the second half, at 10 15, you get pushed back 10 30, 10 45. Yeah, I, I just don't like it. And, and guess what? People are going to say it's, it's fair on both sides. So yeah. that is true. But man, it's just like, dang, man, I'm I, I might start yawning at halftime. 
<laughs> I'll tell you who'll be there covering it all. He won't be yawning. Is Mike Wilson. We got him on next to get all of this squared yeah. away. Talking Tennessee Vols. It is Blaine and Mickey. Powered by All Four Seasons Garage Doors. Tennessee, it's Blaine Bishop here. And with the unpredictable weather hitting us hard, it's crucial you ensure your home is equipped for any challenge. So don't let the power outage uh, catch you off guard. Cool Ray's Heating, Cooling, Plumbing, and Electrical has your back. And they're offering an incredible $1,500 off select at-home generators. And yes, you heard it right, $1,500 off. So don't gamble with your family's safety. Act now and secure your peace of mind with Cool Ray. And if that's not enticing enough to take advantage of their $49 tune-up for your HVAC system, it's perfect for ensuring your home stays comfortable in any weather. And if you've been thinking about uh, upgrading to a new HVAC system, they're offering a free estimates on replacements. And their expert comfort consultants are ready to guide you toward the perfect solution for your home. So Cool Ray, keeping Tennessee cool, plumbing right, and lights bright. So visit CoolRay.com to take control of your home's comfort and safety. That's CoolRay.com.
Blaine and Mickey, 1045, oh, the zone. Talking some basketball. We'll get to some Titans talk, too. We got our man playing money because we got our man money, Mike Wilson, oh, yeah. checking in from the Knoxville News Sentinel. Probably sleep deprived after that uh, first couple of round wins by Tennessee. But, uh, Mike, just like you draw it up, you go three for 25 and, and you beat Texas to go to the Sweet 16, right? Is that how you had predicted that one to go? Hmm. Yeah, I mean, very easy to predict that, that a team would basically not make a shot outside of a, within three feet of the rim and still win a game. It's pretty much, yeah, how you draw it up every time. Uh, we had had this discussion. It may have been after your last appearance. And, and basically we're saying, you know, the odd thing about this, maybe the wildest wild card about a Rick Barnes' Tennessee team is there's going to be some nights where they just don't hit anything, but they could win a game scoring in the 60s, and then they go and score 62 and beat a really good Texas team with – with A++ plus plus players on it. Like Blaine said, all kinds of athletic guys. But that defense that Barnes always knows you can unpack and win with, son of a gun. They It was an emergency, and they broke the glass and took the took the you know next-level defense out, which they always play great, and, and that advanced them. You know, it's interesting in a way because I, I do think this team has looked more comfortable in, in offensive-focused games. Um, in, in, you know, in Alabama or in Auburn or a game where if it gets in the eighties, they're fine with it. Uh, you know, a run and gun with Arkansas sort of thing. And uh, whereas the past three ish seasons, you're more used to seeing what you saw on Saturday of a, you know, 62, 58 rock fight, yep. tense game. Uh, and so it was interesting because those are the, the, the games that Tennessee's kind of lost this year. Uh, you know, South Carolina, the first A&M game, which, you know, despite the fact A&M made so many shots, Mississippi State games, th- those are games Tennessee struggled with. So it was really impressive that they turned straight to what you're saying, their trademark, their toughness, their defense, their rebounding, and bully-balled Texas uh, on their way to the Sweet 16. It was completely against so much of what this team's done well. Not saying not good defensively. They're very good defensively. But, but playing in that low-scoring game is so much more a trademark of previous teams than this team. It was a very impressive way to win a game. Sure was. Uh, and they're one of the teams in this tournament who, when they needed that, they had it, and they went to it, just like we needed Mike Wilson. So we called him. He's at by Mike Wilson on Twitter, Knoxville News Sentinel. Well, Mike, uh, after watching uh, you know, a defensive effort type game here for Tennessee, uh, I guess give us the keys to why you thought they won the game. Because I, I thought the role players really step up. We're talking about Owaka and that mm-hmm. group. Uh, so what were your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, Toby Awaka was the most important and valuable offensive player on the court. If he'd been able to play 20 minutes uh, and <laughs> right. not been in foul trouble, he might have had 20 and 10. Right. right. Um, I mean, he, he was absolutely outstanding. Um, I thought Jeremiah Meshack brought so much value mm-hmm. and intensity rebounding um, and defensively. I thought Jordan Ganey was really good defensively. Uh, Josiah Jordan James had 9-9. Nine and nine. Santiago Vescovi, I think, had three or four steals. steals. Mm-hmm. I mean, it, there were so many players doing it well. Um, and you talk about the clutch nature of Jonas Adu and Dalton Connect to go six for six in the free throw line down the stretch. So, um, I mean, tremendous. And you probably can't say enough either about Zakai Ziegler playing all 40 minutes. Uh, in a game like that, playing that long uh, and that well is a, an incredibly impressive thing to do. Man, that that's insane just to think about. And uh, I thought uh, that they were doing some things to force him to kind of be a little bit outside of his comfort zone, and he had to, you know, take shots at the end of uh, you know, the clock and everything else. But uh, because guys weren't getting open, and let alone they were missing shots. So, what were they doing? Do you think, or is just one of those nights for you know to kind of contain Ziggler? Yeah, I, mean, I thought maybe what Texas did best was it was contain Dalton Connect. Um, oh, well, yeah, he was. They, they made his life really hard early. It didn't took maybe two shots in the first 10 minutes. Uh, I think he only had four points at halftime. Yeah, he did. Uh, or something near that. So, uh, I mean, he, they contained Dalton really well. And Zakai and Dalton both went, I believe, one of eight from three. Uh, it was one of those weird nights. But, I mean, Texas, you talk about that roster. Their guards are really good. They've got a couple in, good inside players in just Sue and Mitchell. Uh, it's a really talented roster where kind of the line I've used is you know, the – the parts are better than the sum of the parts for some reason. And uh, the way they could play defense, the guys they could throw at Tennessee, the ball seemed unsurprised that it, be, that it became a, a absolute physical throw-down battle. Um, that's kind of what they expected to go into. So 
they weren't shocked. Yeah, I thought Texas just did a really good job of, of playing such a physical brand. Ah, so is that the reason why Connect wasn't connecting, or was it just Connect just having an off night? What do you think? I mean, a lot of shots weren't falling. I thought Tennessee had pretty good looks a lot of the mm-hmm. time. Um, it was, in, in so many ways, it felt similar to that Michigan loss in the NCAA tournament two years ago. Oh. Uh, I think Tennessee was two of 18 from three in that one. And it just, it really had that feeling of these are really good shots. They're just not going in. Um, I mean, if Tennessee shoots closer to season average, they're probably eight of 25 from three in that game. Mm-hmm. And they win by 15 or so. Uh, so. Shots just weren't falling to some extent, but I did think, I mean, the fact that Dalton barely had any shots early in the game tells you that uh, Texas was doing a good job on him mm-hmm. and forcing other people to try to beat them. But um yeah, I mean, Tennessee obviously still found a way. We're on with uh, Mike Wilson for Knoxville News Sentinel. It was nice to see Triple J get some things going offensively. You know, he's such a big body, and finally he started to take his big self to the rim and see what he could do. Uh, you think, gosh, if he and Santee, they had 11 points together in this game, imagine if they could get like 15 or 16 together. And it's probably going to come to that at some point, and it's probably coming to that point against Creighton, um, which – where Tennessee can beat Creighton to me is the depth. Tennessee has a lot more depth than, than Creighton does. Creighton relies really on three guys. They've got a fourth guy that scores, but uh, three guys that score like 17 a game. So if you can go out there, take one of those guys away and get some production from, from your fourth or fifth guys, you're, you're probably feeling really great. But you know, when you talk about Josiah against Texas, I think the work he did guarding Dylan DeSue mm-hmm. is probably the most praiseworthy thing. Uh, he did supremely well in that matchup, I thought. Um, handled that very well. And, yeah, again, I mean, the things that he and Santiago Vescovi do defensively and just knowledge-wise on the court, I mean, there was a point about halfway through the first half where, where Santi's on the bench and he, he yelled out to Zakai Ziegler, watch a specific type of screen, and it's exactly what happened on, on that possession. I mean, the, the intangibles and the things that they bring are winning Tennessee games, but, yeah, at some point it might need a little bit more somewhere. Who do you think could be the unsung hero? You talked about depth. Is there, because different guys, you talked about Tobey Awaka, different guys have stepped up at different times. Who could be that unsung guy, do you think, to step up against Creighton where at the end of the night you're like, man, his eight points or that guy's, you know, six rebounds or whatever it was, that really helped win the game? Well, here, here's the thing that Tennessee has going for it. It could be a lot of guys. Mm-hmm. Um, it could be Tobey Awaka. It, it's been him at points. He won them the game at Missouri it, to an extent, which would have been a catastrophic loss. Um, Jordan Ganey, uh, the first Alabama game, I think got 15 points. So there's guys coming off that bench that, that can do that and be that. Jemai Meshack wins them games defensively, but he's also chipped in offense at points. His three-point shot has come a long way. So those are those three guys coming off the bench there. But you can talk about, well, what if you suddenly got a 14-point game from Santiago Vescovi? <sighs> Uh, I mean, that, that's, that changes everything um, in terms of Tennessee's overall profile because that's taking pressure off Dalton Connect, Kai Ziegler, so on and so forth. But all of this to say, maybe the beautiful thing for this Tennessee team is it could be any of those guys. They, they don't have to say, all right, that is the guy that we need to step up for us today because um, you've seen so many guys do it at different points. But that said, Tobey Awaka is a guy who's been playing really well um, the past couple games. Um, he had a horrendous game against Mississippi State um, in the SEC tournament, but he has responded and been really, really good um, in the two NCAA tournament games so far, and that's been great for the Vols. Hanging out with our man Mike Wilson uh, from Knoxville News Sentinel at by Mike Wilson on Twitter or X, whatever you want to call it. Mm. Well, Mike, you talked a little bit about Creighton, and I guess they have three scores. Kind of give us a, a roundabout quick version of what they like to do offensively and defensively real quick. Uh, kind of understand the team a little bit better and what Tennessee needs to do to make sure they win. Yeah, high-scoring team doesn't necessarily play the fastest. Um, Very efficient, though, um, in terms of shot, shot quality. They make their shots count. Um, I think it's a three-point shooting inside team, not a heavy mid-range team, I think is kind of the profile. Um, High-scoring wing in a 6'7 guy, high-scoring guard, high-scoring 7'1 big man. The latter being the biggest concern to me if I'm the Vols because that's an area where Tennessee has struggled this year um, is good scoring big men when you look back to, to November. And obviously, Jonas Adu has come a long way since then, but that's kind of been a thing that Tennessee has struggled with at times. Um, yeah, so don't play the fastest. Don't force a ton of turnovers. 
Um, not the best rebounding team necessarily. So there are, are places where you can see where Tennessee can have success in this matchup. Mm-hmm. Um, I thought what Oregon did against Creighton gave some semblance of a blueprint, um, holding Creighton to 62 points in regulation, where it was really impressive by Oregon. And Tennessee is capable of, of holding teams to 60s, low 70s. So if they're able to do that, they'll have a shot. Mm, hey man. Mike Wilson for Knoxville News Sentinel. I guess, were there any surprises for you in the SEC? Man, I, I was stunned that most of them got X out. Only left is Tennessee and Alabama. Who else is left? That's it. Oh, that's it. Yeah, that, that was, man, I was, I was a little disappointed about that. Yeah, I mean, we can run through them. Uh, I, I was surprised Florida lost to Colorado. Um, I thought Florida was playing great basketball, and obviously that game came down to the wire at 102-100. Uh, but Colorado also has a top-five NBA pick on the team, and when that's a 10 seed, that, that kind of equalizes things. Mississippi State was a huge disappointment. Um, just really got out of their game against Michigan State. That was rough. Auburn is the biggest problem in terms of the losses that, ten- that the SEC had, I think. I think, honestly, even more so than Kentucky. And reason being, Auburn's a team you were talking about as a Final Four team coming out of the SEC tournament and having a shot to, to give UConn a really hard game in the Sweet 16. Kentucky losing to Oakland is horrendous. However, we knew Kentucky couldn't play defense, and Kentucky was boom or bust in this tournament, and they completely busted um, because they never learned to play defense the whole season. Um, South Carolina was not a shock to me. Um, I think South Carolina's been out over their skis all season, um, had an outstanding year, won a lot of games. Analytics said they were one of the worst at large teams in the tournament, and they went out and lost to basically two players um, for Oregon and in Folly Dante and Jermaine Cuisinart, the late, latter of whom transferred from South Carolina and then dropped 40 on South Carolina. Um, problematic results, especially after Greg Sankey's comments. Um, not necessarily shocking results, given, you know, again, Alabama, Kentucky are boom or bust. Alabama boomed, Kentucky busted. Um, and then a massive disappointment in Auburn and a very, very sad outcome for a Kentucky team that has so much NBA talent. Mm, no doubt about it, Mike Wilson. One more last thing. I know you wrote an article on, uh, I guess, uh, Barnes there uh, helping connect with uh, his free throw shooting. Kind of take us through that story. I thought that was really interesting. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, so, so yeah, late February, Dalton had kind of had a rough five-game stretch shooting free throws. He'd been in the gym a lot after practice. He'd come back out after a couple games to to shoot free throws and yeah, there was just a practice, and I was kind of the last one there talking with, with some people, and including Rick Barnes, and he left to go show Dalton um, something. I didn't know what it was at the time, but, uh, yeah, I asked Dalton Saturday kind of what, what was the lesson that day, and he said, yeah, Rick basically went and <laughs> – there's a, there's a lowered hoop in the concourse, like the underneath concourse at, at Thompson Bowling Arena, and Rick Barnes got in it and basically was, was showing Dalton Connect this is how big a hoop is. Like a human can stand inside this easily. So you can put a basketball through this, um, like from the free throw line. You're such a good shooter. You're perfectly capable of hitting these free throws. And then you saw that come to fruition. Obviously the final 24, 24 seconds, the balls hit all six free throws with Dalton hitting four in a row in the final 8.8. So just kind of a, a full circle moment back to that uh, teaching moment, I guess. Mm, there you have it. Mike Wilson with Knoxville News Center. Mike is so big he would not fit inside a basketball oh. hoop because his gigantic <laughs> presence of covering the Vols, that's why his aura is so big is what I'm talking about. Oh, okay. uh, can the Vols' defensive aura win them any more games if they're just like totally bankrupt shooting the basketball, or do you think that ends if they come out similarly and finish similarly against Creighton? Yeah, I mean, I think that ends if you come out that way against Creighton. Uh, Creighton is so much more offensively gifted than Texas. Texas was a decently average offensive team. I mean, they scored, what, like 50-something against Colorado State in the uh, opening round for them. Texas was not great offensively. Creighton is very good offensively. And this whole Midwest regional is very good offensively. Um, The other three teams in in Creighton, Gonzaga, and Purdue are ranked in the top 11 in offensive efficiency in the country. Um, So you're going to have to score some points and stop the other team, obviously, but I don't think 62 points is probably going to do it um, against Creighton. If this team, let's say they had lost somehow, that Texas comes back, they win the game. Did getting to the Sweet 16, does that kind of stop the the complete meltdown whenever they lose their next game? Or does this team need to make the Elite Eight to quiet all the critics and all the Barnes in March talk? 
it's hard because, and I think this is something people underestimate about the tournament. Once you get to this regional round, to some extent, it's a crapshoot. Um, it is every team left is really good. Mm-hmm. You're not facing a bad basketball team. Like I get losing to Florida Atlantic last year is bad optically. That team went to the final four. Its head coach has got hired at Michigan this week. It's a good basketball team with a good coach. Uh, it, it's no one's left. that's bad. Um, so you have to be at your best and be outstanding to keep advancing. That said to me with this particular Tennessee team, it's kind of got to be an elite eight team. Um, uh, it's so talented. You've got the best scoring guard in college basketball. You've got so many old guys, uh, an elite point guard, a, a really good big man. You've got so many pieces that say that you should be in the final eight teams, but you've also got a team that you're going against that is equally capable. So um, that's my roundabout way of saying, yeah, Tennessee would do itself a favor by getting to the elite eight. I think that would qualify this season as a success no matter what happens in that Elite Eight round. But there's already some successful things to it, and it's very hard once you get to the stage to say, yeah, sure, you're going to go win that game because, yeah, again, you're playing a great team no matter what. Well, I hope you got a a big uh, Jolt Cola or something to sit next to you at the table. This is going to be a late one against Creighton. Buddy, I'm going to be popping raw caffeine, just like (laughs) coffee beans in my mouth. (laughs) We've been joking about it like, I'm just going to be eating coffee beans directly on press row because after the Zach E.D. free throw display is over in the first game, we're going to start at 11 o'clock. <laughs> oh, oh, man. Uh, I hope that does <gasps> not happen. We're, uh, we're going to start conditioning ourselves now for it. Hey, uh, we know you'll be there to cover all of it, and people can read all about it. By Mike Wilson, Knoxville News Sentinel. That's where the magic happens. Thank you, sir, and uh, travel safe this week. As always, peace. Always. Thank you guys so much. Yes, sir. The one and only Mike Wilson. Love catching up with him and covering the balls and uh, giving his perspective uh, if you missed it, you just joined us late. Remember, you can always catch everything we do on the Blaine and Mickey podcast. Rate, right? review, subscribe, wherever you get your podcast, and you'll be set to go. You can uh, listen again or listen for the first time. Uh, when we come back, March Madness is also Ding Dong Madness. Mondays, Ding Dong of the Week, a lot of candidates. Ooh, a lot of candidates. You got a candidate. Drop a Ding Dong in the FNM Bank chat or call us 615-737-1045. It is time for you to say goodbye to Busted Brackets because FanDuel is going to let you bet on every game of this tournament, whether you're betting on a big upseed or a big upset, or maybe you like a one seed. I'm combining words again, but I can combine this. It's time to go dancing on America's number one sports book. That's the combination because right now new customers get $200 in bonus bets if your first $5 bet wins. I love the chalk in this tournament. The top seeds have been rolling. So how about this? I'm going to stick with those one seeds. UNC, Purdue, UConn. I like all of them to move on. And honestly, I'm not so sure. I'm not ready to just pick UConn to win the whole thing. You can pick whatever you want, though. And you got 200 bucks to use on point spreads, money lines. You can even pick who's going to win it all. Just visit FanDuel.com slash Mickey and bet on college hoops until they cut down the nets. Do you have to be 21 or older, though? Present in Tennessee. First online real money wager only. $10 first deposit required. Bonus issued as non-withdrawable bonus bets. Expire seven days after receipt. See terms of sportsbook.fanduel.com. Gambling problem? Call the Tennessee Red Line at 1-800-889-9789.
Blade and Mickey ring a ding, ding, dong. It is time for Ding Dong of the Week brought to you by Mark Spain. Just go to MarkSpain.com and get a guaranteed offer on your home today and start packing. It's that simple. MarkSpain.com, start packing. You don't have to, like, change the carpet or anything. You just sell it. Keep it. Keep on trucking. I uh, appreciate Mark Spain. Appreciate you guys checking in for Ding Dong of the Week. Let's see. Uh, we got oh, some we put that on. Ding Dongs in the FNM Bank chat. Emmett says Ding Dong of the Week goes to Georgia running back ETN. Oh, of man. course, don't drink and drive, especially after Jalen Carter's incident. There's been multiple incidents down there. We were trying to talk through all of them in the break. This seems to be a recurring theme. I'm wondering why. Like, I'm sure, it's, man, it's like something they must do there within the school. Like, I don't know, I think it's just the players. I think the players are just the ones getting, you know, uh, caught here. Uh, and they're talking about it. I'm sure other people have gotten uh, tickets as well. It's just like, wow, this keeps happening over. I know Kirby is addressing that, man. That This is, oof, going to a whole nother level. Even when we had Panda here, remember he was up there doing donuts. Remember head that? driving, yep, 100%. Head like, driving like, issues. Thing. Yep. Like they, yeah, man, wow. Um, so... And hopefully they finally figured out, you know, us ding dong men. We it take us a minute to figure stuff out. Uh, I just imagine as many times as this happened, so everything kind of goes downhill. So the athletic director got a call at four in the morning. Kirby Smart got another call at four in the morning. There's a lot of phone calls at four in the morning. Well, there have been multiple instances of people passed away as a result of bad decisions driving cars. Mm. So like you were saying in the break, it's not like he's not – it's not like they ha- – there's no telling how much Kirby has talked to them about this. Oh, yeah. I mean, I'm I, sure they made them do some stuff, too. Hey, sure. Man, it's just, that's why I said I think it's just a thing maybe just in Athens, Georgia. Like, maybe there's something going on there. Not just the players. Just Even at the school, I have no idea. But, man, this just keeps happening. You might have to walk down there and just take every player said their keys. Like, you're not driving. <laughs> Sorry. I mean, you can't take their freedom, but uh, I mean, you can walk. There's, hey, go go get one of those bird scooters on the uh, on the sidewalk. Uh, oh, Alec, uh, the guy, I, I don't know, but whatever they've done, obviously, hasn't worked because you got another problem here. Maybe it worked for some, but it didn't work for this new guy to the team. Uh, Alex says, "Ding dong of the week is Greg Sankey." A lot of talk about Greg Sankey wanting to expand the NCAA tournament and at the expense of whom it might be. Including mm-hmm. little schools, so we'll see how yeah. that goes. Well, how about Ball State? The, the funny, yeah. the funny thing about that is because he he wanted more bids for program. SEC for SEC schools, and then SEC went two and six uh, in the first round. It's bad timing. It was really bad timing. Well, if you're Greg Sankey, it's your job to get as much as you can for the for the conference you represent. And my gosh, he is constantly going after that. Or three and five. That's what they went. Takes A and M one. They lost second weekend, but yeah. Uh, let's take a couple of ding dong phone calls. We will share ours. Kyle in Springfield actually beat our man Eric to the punch today. Hello, Kyle. What's going on, boys? Man, you tell us. What's happening? I actually got to nominate myself for my egregious <laughs> shot I called last week. The uh, uh, no the, the no one seeds uh, make it to yeah. the second weekend. Yep. Yeah. Oh, that was hell, man. But I actually, I actually got another one that's really interesting. So NASCAR this weekend was racing down at Circuit of the Americas in Austin. Yep. And NASCAR usually doesn't do track limits like F1 and IndyCar does. They assess the second place driver in the Xfinity Series a 30-second track limit penalty. He went from second place to 27th. Yeesh. What was the egregious thing that he had done to get such a harsh penalty? Dude, I don't even think it was that bad. I think he got bumped off the course for a second. Wow. Everybody was bumping everybody. I saw part of the uh, the race yesterday, part of the cup race. And, I mean, that's racing on a course like that. Wow. I would, hey, they need everything they can do to make – appreciate the call. They need to do everything they can to make racing – exciting for just regular people to watch <laughs> on TV. I mean, did you see that story from a few weeks ago? Joey Logano got like, he, he won the thing and then they took it away from him because he had a modified glove that had like webbing in between the fingers. So oh, almost yeah. like, 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 like a frog. Uh-huh. Uh, and they were like, oh no, I gave him a competitive advantage. His what? gloves. His gloves. Yeah. For, for, ra- for, for gripping of the steering wheel. His gloves. I, yeah. They were illegal gloves. Yeah. 
<laughs> they took away they took away a win from him because of that. Oh my. It was really egregious. They helped him hold on to the hundred percent. I mean, look out look at those egregious gloves. Uh Eric is never egregious. He always checks in with the ding dong force. Hello, Eric. Hey guys, this is one I'm actually kind of surprised nobody's brought this up. It's kind of been floating out there for a while, but I got to bring this one up. It has to go to the Los Angeles Lakers organization and the people who are involved in the crafting of the statue of Kobe Bryant. I don't know if you guys heard about this. So apparently, you know, and this has been going around for a while. I have no idea how long the statue has been up, but apparently Eagle Eye fans noticed that there were a few misspelled words on the statue. I don't, remember what the words were. I think somebody said what they were specifically, but guys, that is bad. The fact that you take the time to craft something like that to honor the late great Kobe Bryant, I don't know how long the statue's been up, but apparently several fans noticed that there were a few words on the statue, and that's pretty bad, something like that's going on. But guys, that's mine. Guys, y'all take care, and we'll talk to you again soon. Mm. Oh, I didn't see that. Yeah, so I, I did see this. Oh. Um, so this came out on March 12th is when people really started, or like around the middle of March is when it uh, really started coming out. Um, but they misspelled uh, Jose Calderon's name, uh, Von Wafer's name, and uh, put that one player was did not play from a coaching decision when they were actually did play in the game because they have that stat. They have like a box score on the bottom uh, from the game right. uh, that the statue was from. And like they misspelled, they misspelled decision, they misspelled names, they forgot like letters. It was really bad. Mm. Really, really bad. Especially for a guy like Kobe Bryant, who who's so important to that organization. And they just they botched that. Oh man. Somebody, in trouble. Somebody needs to be in a lot of trouble. Come on, man. You got a proofreader at the statue company. Somebody's got to. Well, speaking of trouble, that's what my ding dong is. What will Kentucky do, as Ron Slate would say? What are they going to do with Calipari? 30 something million bow? They can afford it. Oh, yeah. You, they, so, can, they can produce that, by the so way. So now, what is the decision? This is going to be an interesting one. one what do you think is going to happen? One tournament win in the last five years. For a program that is supposed to be competing for championships year in and year out. And they have one tournament win in five years. Do you buy him one more year and say, okay, change your philosophy, tweak it a little bit. Don't sign all all All-American guys coming in as freshmen. Sign some veteran players. Because that was his excuse is... They're we freshmen. don't have any veteran right. players. Yeah, all, yeah. well, it's easy Sorry, to say. Right. Oh, come on, man. Yeah. You, 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 you can go get them. I right. mean, it's like, like some guys wouldn't want to go You there. buy the groceries, Cal. Yeah. Right. So does he tweak it and get a couple, you know, proven, you know, guys in college basketball that are really good? Question is. Or do you, to buy himself one more year to see if that's really the case. The question is, is he actually going to do that? Is he going to go against. Right, what, that's what I said. Do you, right, he could still say, yeah, and then don't do it. If he mm. wants to keep his job, he should go to the transfer portal and just attack and attack and attack and get veteran players. Because if he if his excuse is, oh, sorry, all my all my star players are freshmen, they just haven't been here. Well, But they win a whole season, though. That's, yeah, they're not, they're what, not freshmen anymore, in my mind. <laughs> You assembled the team, Cal. You the one that picked it all freshmen. You're the one that doesn't have any veteran players because you keep getting one and done. I think he likes that built-in excuse. I really do. It's, I mean, it's protected him. Yeah, well, let's, uh, let's do this. Let's finish up the ding-dongs on the other side. Phone lines ringing 615-737-1045. Again, FNM Bank Chat open. You can tweet us at Blaine and Mickey on Twitter. Heck, you can follow us at Blaine and Mickey on Twitter or on Insta. It's the same handle, at Blaine and Mickey. Hour number two coming up, including... The Jerry Sneed to the Titans. We got a lot to get to, and we will do it all with you on Blaine and Mickey, powered by All Four Seasons Garage Door. <laughs> How many of you have lived here a long time? Well, you already know Eurofix has been in Middle Tennessee area for European car repair needs now for 24 years. We've all gotten to watch them grow. And I don't know about you, but I love watching a hometown business take off. 
Well, we are now proud to announce the fifth location in Mount Julia for Eurofix on Mount Julia Road, right across the street from Dairy Queen. And Eurofix can serve you in Franklin, Hundred Oaks, Murfreesboro, Belmead, and now Mount Juliet. Pretty cool getting to watch a small-town mechanic starting in the barn in his backyard of a single-wide trailer and now grow to five locations repairing thousands of cars each month. And at Eurofix, you get a three-year nationwide warranty and a free loaner car with every repair appointment. And all you have to do is just give them a call at 844-EUROFIX. That's right, 844-EUROFIX, or you can just visit them online at myeurofix.com. That's myeurofix.com. But I always tell them Blaine, did you?
Good afternoon. I'm Joseph Bonanno. It is 2-0-1. Over the weekend, the Titans continue to make a big splash in the offseason, trading for Chiefs cornerback Legereus Sneed for a 2025 third-round pick and a 2024 seventh-round pick swap. The Titans also gave Sneed a reported four-year, $76 million deal that settles him as cornerback one in Tennessee. This morning in the NFL, NFL owners unanimously voted to ban the hip drop tackle, which will now be a 15-yard penalty and an automatic first down against teams and players that utilize the technique. Vanderbilt men's basketball has hired a new head coach as James Madison's Mark Byington is headed to Nashville. Byington led the Dukes to a 54-15 and record over the last two seasons, including to the second round of this year's NCAA tournament after defeating five-seed Wisconsin in the first round. The women's NCAA tournament continues today as six seed Lady Vols face three seed NC State in the second round at 3 p.m. Central Time. Tennessee took down Green Bay 92 to 63 on Saturday in the first round. For all your foundation repair and waterproofing needs, visit USSTN.com. Breaking news at once on your home for the Titans and Vols. This is 1045 The Zone. Blaine and Mickey, 104.5 The Zone. What's up, everybody? Hour number two of this two-hour extravaganza on your radio or The Zone app, which download that if you haven't, or uh, wherever you are listening today. We appreciate it on this Monday. Hopefully you had a nice basketball overdose. Maybe you got a Titans overdose. Legereus Sneed yeah. trade reportedly being consummated by the Titans and the Chiefs. It was interesting. There were some conflicting reports at one point during the week that the Chiefs and the Titans knew what they wanted to do, but the Titans hadn't yet come to an agreement with Legereus Sneed, but the reported amount, uh, $19 million per year over four years, $55 million guaranteed, a 2025 third rounder, 2025, and then they're swapping whatever the Titans' best seventh round pick is with the Chiefs. They're just, In 2024? This 2025? year. Yeah, oh, this, this year. year. They're swapping oh. seventh round pick. Oh. Swap Which would them. be how many spots? The Chiefs, it wouldn't be that many spots. So, Well, I mean, you know, hearing that, I, I feel like that's a great get for the Titans. Yeah. Because LaDarius C, people forget capital. that he was a third-round pick. I, I remember following this kid in Louisiana Tech. That's why I was uh, I, I liked him so much because I felt like I knew him really well. He uh, ran a really good time at the uh, – Combine, I can recall. I thought that would bolt him into the first round conversation or maybe the back end of a first round. It didn't. He still went with third or fourth round or so. Uh, Ladarius Snee. So, yeah, I was stunned by that, but I, I'm not stunned by how he performed because he has all the measurables. Uh, he has length. He's tough, especially for a guy with his kind of length, which most of those guys aren't great tacklers. Uh, he's got dog, a uh, really good dude. So there's nothing that I didn't like about. It. Now I was hoping you get him in free agency. I didn't want to give up capital, but a 2025 third round pick and a swap uh, in the later rounds, uh, you still get your pick. I, yeah, I think that's how oh, that's fine, man. Yeah. So now you got two quality starting, uh, you know, corners. Uh, so yeah, I think they're on the right track, man. I'm I'm pleasantly surprised on all their their moves. They make very strategic. Smart. It's just a matter of how quickly the team can come together when it's going to really be a lot of new pieces. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, so that's always key for me because chemistry is key. That's how you take it to the next level. But I'm interested to see who they sign if if they are going to sign a young guy or just draft a guy uh, or an unproven guy maybe in this league uh, at safety opposite a hooker. But uh, the secondary is coming together really well. I, you know, I heard a lot of people talking about this may be the best secondary. I laugh when I hear stuff like that. That's absolutely funny to me. <laughs> really? Like, uh, you know, I heard people say, oh, what was the best corner combo? Well, let's go corner combo. So who's been the best corner combo? Who was with Cortland Finnegan? M- McCourty? Uh, McCourty. And was it briefly? Or Dyson. Re- was it? Was it briefly Ronaldo Hill? Remember him? He was oh, yeah, yeah, for a short time. Right. But yeah, I'm trying to look for the the best corner combinations, the two outside guys. And so I go, well, nobody's going to ever exceed the, the first two. Well, it, yeah, it, yeah. Or, or Walker. Yeah, I mean they they were pretty good, let alone with D Mitch in the slide. 
Uh, so uh, with me and, and, and Mark Robb, it's safety. So that that was a really unique. So then I go, okay, Cortland Finnegan with McCourty maybe or uh, with the Dyson, mm-hmm. uh, the brother. Uh, so Andre Dyson. Uh, I'm trying to think if he was with McCourty or was he with Finnegan. So yeah. those are the only combination go because you're talking about elite. Like I'm sure you're putting Sneed in this elite category, mm-hmm. Samari in the elite category. Uh, and then you say, okay, who was opposite them? So um, McCourty and Finnegan overlapped for two years, 2009 to 2011. See, I'm trying to look at what other cornerbacks overlapped each other. And mind you, you know, Finnegan, you know, made the Pro Bowl. Mm-hmm. Has he made the Pro Bowl? Yeah. yeah so okay. um, Alteron Werner was also... Uh, Werner was a pro bowler at the time, I think. He, he was also in there with uh, the same range as McCourty and right. Finnegan uh, in that 2010 uh, time frame. Good player. He, I, I wouldn't put him in an elite, but yeah, he would be in the uh, But just just yeah, for like the, for groups, mm-hmm. for yeah. groups, yeah. Um, Legere Sneed actually no pro bowls. I thought he I'm made one. See? You're right. Not, See? not one. See? So, no so pro so bowls, the, no all pro. Wow. See, so that's why when people kept on saying – He's an elite corner. I, I would back up just a little bit and say he's a really good corner. Uh, depending on style, the type of offense and defense that you run, people must not forget now, you know, Spagnola, who's a D.C. there, was my D.B. coach in Philly. He runs a lot of combination of uh, zone coverages as well. Mm-hmm. So it's not like he's up there in man-to-man. But what I do love is you see him in man-to-man getting after people, and I mean getting after him. I mean, I remember – uh, he went after Tariq Hill, got him on a jam, and, and buried him. It was a national televised game and then jumped on him, you know, and Tariq Hill didn't do nothing. Yeah, he like, you got me. <laughs> I messed that up. Yeah. So uh, this guy, you know, he's he's going to be elite. Now, that's not to say he's not going to get beat or anything like that, but long as he's uh, past his physical as far as his health, I'm I'm cool with that because people miss practice all the time and long as he was in the game. So obviously they knew something that we didn't. So I'm cool with that as long as that's okay. Mm. Uh, you know, you still have to be official uh, from the Titans. But other than that, man, there's nothing that I didn't like. I, I didn't get to see him tested a lot as much as I wanted to see him on deep balls mm. and see that deep in 4-3-7 that he ran at the combine because that was a stunner for me. I thought he was a more 4-4-5-ish four, four, guy. But when he did that, I was like, oh. And then he, I think he was 41-inch vertical. He he ran some good times. His 10-yard mm-hmm. shuttle, I mean, uh, you know, at the box uh, in the 40 were great. So, yeah, I think they're getting a really good player. Uh, you know, some people will say, oh, he's a number one corner. But in my mind, that doesn't really exist today. Just he's a really good elite corner uh, opposite another good solid corner, starting corner in the National Football League. And they're going to get after the quarterback. So it's going to be real interesting how they match up. And, uh, you know, he's going to be isolated on the island. So there's going to be opportunities for people to make plays on him. But, and I, I like what I've seen so far. He got he even got beat multiple times. And I say this, maybe three or four times that I saw in the actual Super Bowl, mm-hmm. they just didn't throw to his guy. Mm-hmm. And when I say open, like he fell down, he slipped, or he got juked. So that's what I'm getting at. Like, when you talk about number one corner, like, okay, Deion Sanders, Rob, what's it? That never happened. That that didn't happen. They were always competing. They may have got beat by a step, but they could recover. Right? And so he was, guys was open. I can mean, uh, remember Ayuk was wide open in the back of the end zone one time. He just juked him and he fell. Mm-hmm. I'm like, uh oh. And that could be because his knee was sore. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> no. So, yeah, they, hey, man, they done a really ran and, and crew and Callahan, man. They, they, I mean, it's, this now is going to turn into a different team, even with the draft pick. So, and they're not done yet with free agency. Maybe big money guys, probably, mm-hmm. maybe. But you know, there's still going to be some role players you get in for three, four, maybe even seven million that contribute to this team. You know, uh, even this season. So, uh, yeah, it's going to be a fresh, new look Titan team, and uh, I'm excited. Especially, uh, what can they do on offense? Got to remember, they're putting all these holes on defense. Remember last year, they drafted all offensive mm-hmm. players. So. Uh, trying to balance that out a little bit and see where it goes. But, uh, yeah, man, this is this is exciting time to be a Titan fan. It's exciting time to get the uh, last ding-dong call. Ding Let's dong. do this. Uh, Nate in Nashville with a final ding-dong. Oh, dong I, I have one more. Yeah. Okay. Well, we'll finish with all of our ding-dongs right after Nate does. Nate, what's up? Oh. Hey, how's it going, fellas? Good. Good, good. 
Yeah, man, I'm loving uh, loving the moves the Titans made. Mm. This latest move made me pull all my Titans gear up out the uh, out the dirty clothes hamper. I put all the Titans stuff up for a while, man. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? Rough you year, watched, you yeah, watched but, it, though, right? You watched it, though, right? Yeah, I watched it, man. I, I wasn't planning to pull it out, but after all these good moves, man, I said, let me pull my gear back out, man. But my ding-dong, it goes to the NFL owners for this uh, – for banning uh, the the hip drop tackle, they just making it harder and harder for defenders. You know what I mean? And uh, I love your show, guys, and uh, keep up the good work. Thanks for taking my call. Thank well, you. Well, that's Nate. what I was going to add as my ding dong. Was that I, I? I really feel like this is like the horse collar, somewhat. Like there's a, sometimes it's just not another way to tackle a guy. And so I, I'm trying to think of how many times I probably have done that. I don't know, probably less than a handful of times in a game. So it's going to be real interesting to see how this is implemented because. You know, sometimes guys are doing it intentionally. There's no doubt about it. But there's sometimes I think guys are just trying to get the guy down. And it just comes about that way. And I don't know how many injuries have come about this for them to push this so fast. I, I'm not paying attention to that. But, I, man, I, all I could say is, you know, I could only think of one or two. But Pollard's tackle a couple years ago. And, and then uh, I can't even think of another Can, one. So Tannehill. I just don't remember a whole bunch of them. Tannehill, his, both his ankle injuries were off the, the hip drop. And, and what's so bad? And now, look, I'm, I'm all about the Titans, uh, but I, I didn't think those were penalties. Did they get penalties for that? No, no, because they mm-hmm. right. went, See, went that, a penalty. I, I didn't think those were. It is a penalty. Yeah, he now. got injured, uh, right, but that was an anomaly. That, that didn't happen very often with that kind of tackle. So he already had an injury. So, I mean, I, I just don't understand what they think the players on defense are supposed to do. So, I, I really don't. I don't know if you guys saw, but there was the the video, yeah, uh, the video. of the it, it looked horrible. I mean, but I mean, man, did they just give all the videos of all the times it happened? I, I, like, I, guess. I mean, where are you supposed to like? Sometimes the guy's beating this guy, and then he's doing that, and the guy's running, so he dives for him, and then that's what happened to me. I'm like, what? Well, they're gonna give a guy a penalty for that? Well, so I think where the I don't know. So this is gonna be where it's really interesting and called because in most of the videos, it looks like the what they're p- trying to point out is when the defender grabs the offensive player by the the waist, the waist. or the midsection and swings their legs over, like swings their legs around, like in a swivel action to to bring. To bring watch this! Watch this! See, that's where I have the issue. And th- it lo- that's where and, I have the, the issue. And to me, it looks like okay, if they're gonna just dive at him, then you're putting the defender in risk of getting injured because if you dive at their waist and try to bring them down, then you got legs coming up close to your face and your chest area. Um, and when you swing around, you're swinging your body away from those legs coming down. Hey, let's do this. Let's pick this up on the other side because I do have stats on injuries. I found that this morning. Oh, okay. I'll, I'll show you what the number is. Real quick, Bananas, your ding-dong, and I will share mine. My ding-dong of the week has got to go to the officiating and some of these late uh, like late game situations in the NCAA tournament. I don't. The one specifically that just irritated me was Kansas Sanford in the first round. Uh, Sanford mounting a historic comeback over Kansas, and um, Kansas goes down on a fast break, and Sanford gets this insane chase down block. It's called a foul. You could clearly see that no contact was made on the player. Kansas goes and shoots free throws, kills Sanford. Uh, I think it was like less than 30 seconds left, kills Sanford's comeback, and uh, Kansas goes on to lose eventually to Gonzaga. But not just that game, just all the games the officiating late was just horrendous. Uh, mine was this. I was an associate. I was never the main guy. But Long Beach Athletic Director Bobby Smitherman on Thursday of last week while all the tournament stuff was going on uh, got asked about firing his coach before the tournament. They went on and won their conference tournament, Long Beach, and made the NCAA. said, my belief and hope is that by doing what I did and the timing of it, they would play inspired. And that's what they did. I'm not trying to pat myself on the back, but it worked. Come on, man. And as soon as he said that, they got their butts kicked. Well, yeah, they were gonna they were gonna get throttled pretty good. But uh, come on, man, you you can't do that. Also, for all you future ads, if you fire the coach, tell him to go pick an interim. Let the interim coach in the tournament. Then you don't have this problem. If you're truly going to fire the coach, don't then let the coach coach the tournament. Don't do that. I mean, it worked for Michigan because they picked the interim guy. Remember all those years uh, ago? Ask Romeo Robinson about that. This was ding-dongery of the highest order. Uh, some of these rule changes, NFL, hip drops. Let's get into it. How many people actually get hurt a year? Uh, the num- uh, numbers are out. I'll share those next. Blaine and Mickey, powered by all four seasons garage doors.
below MSRP, below MSRP, below MSRP. It's pretty simple. Two Rivers Ford sells all new non-specialty Fords below MSRP. By the Busted Brackets, because FanDuel is going to let you bet on every game of this tournament, whether you're betting on a big upseed or a big upset, or maybe you like a one seed. I'm combining words again, but I can combine this. It's time to go dancing on America's number one sports book. That's the combination because right now, new customers get $200 in bonus bets if your first $5 bet wins. I love the chalk in this tournament. The top seeds have been rolling. So, how about this? I'm going to stick with those one seeds. UNC, Purdue, UConn. I like all of them to move on. And honestly, I'm not so sure. I'm not ready to just pick UConn to win the whole thing. You can pick whatever you want, though. And you got 200 bucks to use on point spreads, money lines. You can even pick who's going to win it all. Just visit FanDuel.com slash Mickey and bet on college hoops until they cut down the nets. Do you have to be 21 or older, though? Present in Tennessee. First online real money wager only. $10 first deposit required. Bonus issued as non-withdrawable bonus bets. Expire seven days after receipt. See terms of sportsbook.fanduel.com. Gambling problem? Call the Tennessee Red Line at 1-800-889-9789. The guaranteed offer is the easiest way to sell your home. It's really simple. We bring you an all-cash offer. You close in as little as 21 days. No home inspections, no lockboxes, no open houses. Go to MarkSpain.com to get a guaranteed offer and start packing.
Let's see it. Blaine and Mickey, 104.5 The Zone. So the NFL, the owners' meetings are going on now. So like all the coaches and GMs are talking, so you'll see some of that, and you'll hear from different coaches and sound bites and all that. But the other thing they do is they go and vote on all these rules. So the biggest thing that everybody's talking about that has come out of this is the NFL has banned not necessarily hip drop tackle, but as Banana said, the swivel hip drop swivel version of the hip drop tackle. So, so what I does went, that swivel me. Here you go. Is that, uh, are they spinning around on them? NFL.com, maybe so. Hip drop tackle uh, grabs the runner with both hands. This is the NFL's rule. Grabs the runner with both hands or wraps the runner with both arms and unweighs himself by swiveling and dropping his hips and or lower body, landing on the trapping, uh, landing on and trapping the runner's legs at or below the knee. <laughs> Penalty for a hip drop tackle, loss of 15 yards and an automatic first oh, down. Oh, my. Yeah. So. Like, that's a good tackle right there. He's, you know, Bananas is doing a great job. He's putting up uh, videos on our TV here, watching all these hip tackles that they referenced to me. And none of these in my eyes so far are illegal tackles. And I'm all about safety by players, but I mean. I mean, like, yeah, him going out of bounds. Like, that right there on Tanner was not an illegal tackle to me. That, that's just not an illegal tackle. Like, here, here's what they're not understanding in my eyes is that the actual person running is actually trying to get away from you. So they're driving their legs. How yeah. about this? Let's tell them they stop driving their legs. Nobody will swing around because that's what makes them swing around. Now, some of the guys, are, I'm sure, are doing it intentionally, trying to stop them and, you know, trying to show, oh, I can get you down by myself, you know, but they are running. So when you feel that kind of pressure to keep yourself from getting injured, go down. You won't get injured. Now, some of them were standing there, you know, so it was a little tougher, like in the Tannehill video. Mm -hmm. But I, I didn't feel anything about that. That tackle was illegal at all. I, I feel like uh, the tush push is way more dangerous than this. Yeah. Long term. Put it that way. And so how many people are actually getting injured, Mickey? You said you guys said, I don't notice that. But, I, man, I, I can't recall just me watching games and them talking about it. Not a lot, but maybe, obviously, it must have been. So, Mike Garofolo, who's an NFL reporter, he got this. He's at the owner's meeting. Someone had given him this information. There were 230 instances mm -hmm. of the swivel hip drop tackle mm -hmm. last season. That's one per game. Mm -hmm. Of those tackles, 15 players missed time due to injury of the tackle. So of the 200 and something that you mentioned, 230. only 15, 15 were injured. players were yeah. injured. So we changed the rule for 15 players. That's a 6.5% injury like, what, rate. You, I'm sorry, I don't have my earpiece in. 6.5% rate, says Bananas. Right. Thank gosh I didn't have to do the thing. So you. imagine yeah. if you put this same analogy to all the other rules. Man, we'd be doing rules. So that, I, that's why I look at it like this is not the time to do that. But, you know, everything's about safety. So, they, they, you know, especially if it was a lot of quarterbacks that that happened to, I'm sure that was part of the issue. And but. the thing about it is the NFL Players Association is pushing, like, was pushing against it. Like, they were like, no, we don't want this banned. Oh, really? Like, the Players Association, who's right. all about so these safety. Are the players. All about player safety. And they're like, no, we don't want this banned. So, to me, this is just like the owner's. I, I don't know what it is. I don't know if they're scared that they're going to lose, like, a star player or a quarterback, a quarterback. because mm -hmm. of it. And, and so they're just like, oh, let's get it out. But I don't know, man. It, it, the way this is going, eventually defenses are just not going to be in the game. Can I give you – well, we can get to that because I want to ask a former all-pro defensive player what he thinks about all these rules going against the defense. Cause, and, I'll, and I'll do that in just a second. Here's – Kind of a theory for me. And mm -hmm. you guys tell me, cuckoo. No. Okay, here I'm you open. go. How many games have you been saying all along that this league is going to play? Regular 20. season games. 20. Mm -hmm. So 18's the next stop, right? Mm -hmm. Well, we went to 17. Did they expand their rosters? No. no they didn't. So I here's, want them to. <laughs> yeah, I do too. Why, why couldn't it be 60 people? Why couldn't it be 60 people? 60 more jobs. It's multi-billion dollar industry. It, it's 53 now. You can't give seven more people a job. 
Okay. When they go to 18, and inevitably, I think they'll skip 19 and just go to 20. Then they'll have, when like the Buccaneers come here to practice, that will, wink, wink, be the preseason, right? Because mm. there will be 20 games. But it's going to be 18 soon, soon enough. They're making guys fly all over the world to play football games on, on non-football fields in crazy time zones for their body mm-hmm. and all this other stuff, right? Mm-hmm. Here's why they did this. Y'all ready for this? Oh, I see you doing your research here. You ready for this? Yeah, I love it. You got me on the edge of my seat there, Mixter. Hit us. Here, Mixed Master? What's here's you why. Because when all that happens, think about the complete level of unsafety this is for human beings to play football. <laughs> and they can say, not only are we the kings of player safety, we banned hip drop tackles so our players could be safer. It's all just a smoke screen <laughs> right. about safety. Uh, yeah. It's a smoke screen yeah. about safety. There's so they can play more games. You, you look, look left, so you can go right. Yeah. What did you tell us to do? If they say look left, which direction should we look? The, the, the right. right. <laughs> I'm telling you, it, it, they on, never man. failed. They've done this for years. It, I, you know is this is happening. Because this may, I, I'm serious now. I, I want safety, but, man, that that's not enough. 6%? I, I, I would love to see how many other penalties were much higher they didn't even address. I mean, percentages. Six percent? Man, are you kidding me? I I just I I don't know what defenders are supposed to do now because when a guy it, it's like based on that video that that we watched that they played for the press uh, at the press conference after this was announced. You you you're not allowed to tackle guys running away from you. You should just let them run. That that's what that shows me. Because I don't I don't see another way of bringing them down other than wrapping them up from behind. And falling down and bringing them down with you. Are you supposed to push them forward? They're not going to fall. These are high-level athletes. I mean, you can't hit. But you can hit somebody real hard. I've learned this the hard way. You can hit somebody real hard, and they can just spin not know where they at, but they won't go down. <laughs> yep. They, yeah. they, they don't, you know, they're not going to go down. You have to wrap them up. You, you, can't, go, you can't go below the knees. You can't yes. go above the, the nameplate. Yeah. Like, yeah, this is a. Can't grab the back of the jersey, which the horse collar thing, when you see those happen, they seem to always look pretty terrible. Yeah. Uh, so the horse collar thing, I've never heard anybody gripe about horse collar tackling, but this is, what are we going to do when we're in the fourth quarter of a game late in the season and somebody's season is on the line and they make a judgment call where a guy's just pursuing somebody, scratching, clawing, and maybe the guy, maybe somebody makes him slow up a little bit like you always say, make him move. You mm-hmm. tell smart, make him move. I'll get there. Safety comes in, makes the guy move. Guy hits him from behind because he's pursuing him. Mm-hmm. But he hits him around the way, slides down, trying to tackle him because it's a big A strong individual. Yeah, that just he's imagine trying to, this is Big Jeff right. running, going to get somebody, and he gets there. He wants to unload, so he hits the guy. Because maybe it's wet. It, they're sweaty, whatever. He slides down trying to tackle the guy. The guy folds over. Because the guy's still running. He's, he's still, still running. Try, he's trying to get away. Yeah. So that could actually happen. I mean, like, like easy. I, I, just, I do not understand what defenders are supposed to do now. Man, hey, man, they just start diving, cutting legs, man. They probably, <laughs> they'll probably call a penalty on that, too. I just say roughness. I'm not gonna get so mad when I just see somebody go, you know, give them a, a a love bump, boom, and thinking they're gonna knock them down because they guys like, hey man, I don't know how I'm supposed to tackle them, so I'm just gonna do that. <laughs> wow, yeah. There's a. They're also they they actually did a rule. I think you mentioned years ago, maybe two or three years ago, about that the review referee can actually overturn or they're still talking about that. Oh, yeah, so that That's is... That's a big this, one to me. I like that. that no, this in. is new. Yeah. Uh, are you, are you going to read it? NFL uh, replay assistant will now be permitted... This was Pelissero had this. NFL replay assistant will now be permitted to correct certain types of incorrect calls for roughing the passer and intentional grounding. Yeah. It says... It must be purely objective. The quarterback, he said, here's an example. The quarterback wasn't hitting the head. Like sometimes it looks right. like he didn't. Maybe they hit his they shoulder. Told him, right. Uh, mm-hmm. Or he said, or the quarterback was out of the pocket. Yeah. So it, so it wasn't grounded. Right. Mm-hmm. So. Yeah, I like that one. The The idea of the eye in the sky to fix like egregious stuff in real yes. time. I love that. Mm, I don't want the game too. to slow down. And here's the thing. When you start talking about more replay. The thing the NFL has figured out that nobody else has more than anybody, hey, man, 
These are TV shows. They have to be three hours. Mm -hmm. If they start at noon, they got to be done at three because guess what? We're going to show another one back to back. <laughs> and we, They're never late, right? <laughs> Unless it's overtime. They're never late. Well, NFL, after they had that one year of the snafu with all the <laughs> reviews and stuff, yeah. like, hey, oh, we can't do that. that three hours and 20 minutes. <laughs> challenged like uh, PI right. and stuff. Yeah. So, so they were like, and they would never overrule it, even if it was egregiously yes. wrong. They didn't want to, like you said, they're never going to overrule this. Yeah. They're not going to make themselves look bad. So they're like, no, that was fine. That was fine. But it took time. So what they do, killed that immediately. Yeah. So now they've got this thing in real time. But there are times where you can see, looks like a guy gets hit in the head, the flag gets thrown. They immediately show the replay, and we're like, dang, man. Yeah. He hit that guy in the shoulder, and it just his head moved over when he right. hit his he shoulder. shoulder. That's not... So they can fix that in real time. That's a big one to me. Yeah. And then you get, get another extra challenge flag, right, or something like that? You get that right, or is that not? Uh, the NFL approved two other rule changes. So along with swivel hip drops, here you go. This is, the, this is per NFL.com. Uh, they changed the challenge rules, whereas previously coaches needed to get each of their first two challenges correct to get a third. They must get one correct now mm. to get a third. Mm. Good deal. Nice. Okay. Uh, and then... Rule 15, Section 5, Article 2, they're changing the enforcement of a major foul by the offense prior to a change of possession in a situation where both teams have committed fouls? Well, give me an example of that. I have not seen an example of that. Like What, what was it again? They're changing the enforcement of a major foul by the offense prior to a change of possession in a situation where both teams have committed fouls. So major foul, would that be like if there was holding before there was pass interference, maybe? Mm -hmm. If there was a foul on both? I, I haven't found an example. NFL.com just said, here's the other two changes. So that one I'm going to need to see an example. It's a lot to, lot to work through here from my brain. Mm. Yeah. I think Mickey's on to something there. They want to say we're doing everything we can to protect the players. We're a safety player. league, Blaine. Yeah. I mean, yeah. They, it's so listen, hey, guys, this is so safe. You could play 18 games of it. Yeah. No, well, you can play 20. There, there's one more rule that uh, they're putting in for safety, and it's probably the most, I guess people would call it the most dangerous play in football, the kickoffs. Oh. They're still, I, have they voted on that yet, Mickey? I haven't seen anything official. Just well, the the rule on they're talking about doing the XFL kickoff, right. where only the return man and the kicker can move. I'm a big fan of that. If when yeah. I'm the full time commissioner of that. the USXFL, you love it, hundred so percent. I'll be is, taking the credit for is, all these kind of. This things. This is the part of it where I thought was weird. So it, it had to do with the touchback. So if the kicker put it into the end zone or outside of the end zone, then the ball would start on the 35, where the return, like where the return team is lined up. But if it lands within the zone and then bounces out of the end zone, then it's at the 20. There were multiple layers to this oh, about like where they was, would put the ball. Really based, it was super confusing where they would put the ball based on where it landed when the guy kicked it. Oh yeah. It's they need to simplify whatever it is. I don't think it needed all that stuff. Just don't let everybody else move. But that wasn't the rule in the UFL. What was the rule? The rule in the UFL was just whatever line they were lined up, they were 10 yards apart, and nobody could move until the returner caught the, ball. the ball. That right. was it. I think, it's five, I think it's five yards. Was it five yards I, apart? So it's like, so it's oh, the so four, they're not so running into each other. So five yards 40, apart. It's the 40-yard yeah. closer, line closer. and the 35-yard mm-hmm. yes. line. Yes, they want anybody to have a build-up running. Pretty That's much. It. And I, I, saw, I saw like a video like explaining the rules. So basically, it had to do with the touchback. So once the kicker kicks it, there's like a zone from the 20-yard line to the end zone. Uh, and if the ball bounces in that zone and then bounces out, then the ball goes to the 20, and that's where the offense starts. But if the ball goes straight out of the end zone, then it goes to, the, like, the 35, mm. so 15 yards ahead. So, so, now kick, so, now, kickers. so now kickers have to actually, like, place their kickoffs, like, even more strategically now, um, and then you can't move until the ball enters the zone or the returner catches it. Mm-hmm. That part confused me a little bit because yeah. I didn't know if it was – one or the other, or both. Oh, well, you got once you see it live, you understand it, yeah. Because yeah, means, uh, yeah, and that, I actually like that rule, but because uh, they almost took the special team, you know, returner part of it, the game out of the game. Here you I go. I want to keep it in the game. In 2023, only about 20 percent of the NFL's kickoffs were returned. Yeah. None in the Super Bowl was. I've had that. I've been carrying that around because that's what while. we saw when we were watching the what it was the UFL, whatever the name of the league was. Might have been WXFL or something. Yeah, you know, I don't know XFL. That's all the same. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Now they're one, but 
Yeah, that was unique. I thought that was really interesting because through their research, they saw on the kickoffs that a lot of guys would get injured for the collision, for the running, you know, a 40-yard head start, whether it was the guy on the receiving end or the actual guy that was running, running into you. So I thought that was uh, really unique. So now you can't run until it's actually caught by the returner. Then you're <laughs> not far apart. So, yeah, I like that rule. Let's do this. Uh, let's finish up with phone calls. Larry wants to talk about the kickoff rules. Ron in Lebanon wants to talk about the hip drop. And I think Jackie has something to add about Joey Logano's gloves where he got penalized. We're up against the break. Stay. Come straight to you guys. We'll finish up this uh, NFL rules talk when we come back. Uh, come back. Blaine and Mickey powered by all four seasons garage doors. So this is a true story. Uh, most days I get in to the house just a couple minutes before my son gets there and he arrives on the bus. I was trying to beat him home and I've been so tired lately. I would just lay on the couch and go to sleep. Literally, he would wake me up when he came in the house. It was five minutes, 10 minutes, whatever it was. Maybe you've been feeling that lack of motivation, sluggish, run down. Maybe you're gaining some weight that you can't seem to kick. You're feeling grumpy. Guys, all of these things can happen. Maybe you can't sleep. Well, here's what I did. Went to see Edge Peptide Therapy. I want to find out. Maybe it's a testosterone issue. It could be something else. With Edge Peptide Therapy, uh, they're going to make sure that you can take care of yourself because you can't take care of everyone in your family if you can't take care of yourself. Plus, they're different from uh, the other testosterone clinics. Uh, they do more than testosterone therapy. They check all your hormone levels. They make sure that you are running at optimum levels. And here's the thing. As you see them and continue to deal with them, uh, you'll find out they'll continue to modify things to fit you. Right now, they're even offering an everyday low price of $99 a month for testosterone therapy. So if you're not feeling like yourself, you want to take better care of yourself so you can take care of everybody else, here's what you do. Go to edgepeptide.com or call now, 615-724-1878. Schedule an appointment today with Edge Peptide. Get back to yourself.
Blaine and Mickey, 104.5 The Zone. Here's the latest on the NFL kickoff. This is Rich McKay, who I guess is maybe the chairman of the competition committee. This is via ESPN. McKay said Monday, which is today, the owners didn't vote on the proposal to modify the kickoff, but it could still take place on Tuesday. Uh, McKay said, I'd like voting on it sooner rather than later because there's no question that bringing the play back uh, – he said, we had 1,970 touchbacks last season. If you bring that play back in, let's say it might drop to 12,000 or 1,200 of those that become returns. The person you're going to have as a returner is going to matter more. So teams are telling him, look, we're going to have to pick a returner in the draft. So let's get this thing settled. So they'll probably vote on this tomorrow. I modifying mean, the kickoff. That could like completely change like how guys – are graded coming out of, like, college and stuff. Like, some of these guys who are, like, like D. Williams, for example, for Tennessee. Like, I don't know where he's going to go in the draft, probably later. But if you have a new rule change in which returners are even are used even more, some of those guys in college that are known for returners will start to spike up draft boards in the future. Well, they get opportunities. It's at least an opportunity. Like Mark Mariani, he was a seventh-round draft pick and came here and set the kickoff return yardage record because he could return kickoffs because in those days people returned kickoffs. Yeah. Well, I think D. Williams is a little different situation there because he's, he's not a, just a returner. He's also a defensive back. He yeah. also could be a wide yeah. receiver. So you say, okay, I can develop head. this guy. Mm-hmm. Meanwhile, well, we let him return kicks and see what we decide that he's best at, yep. at least at this level. So I think that's a really unique case. I really believe he's going to go. Fifth to seven, he's really fast. Uh, you determine some games. I can remember the one game uh, that was the LSU game when he returned a kick or something like that. Yeah, I think it was at LSU. Uh, anyway, it would change think- the game. Mm-hmm. So he he's a game changer uh, to a certain extent. Some people are going to value that. But him having another position actually really takes it to the next level for yeah. me. I love for the Titans – uh, to get a player like that because everybody's talking, oh, you need a returner. Well, guess what? You get two and one with this kid. And if he doesn't work out even as a returner, well, maybe he's a receiver. Mm-hmm. Oh, well, maybe he's a defensive back. Yeah. See, so you don't lose when you get a guy like that who also is a blazer. Yeah. Like he can run, man. This guy. So I, I really like that in the in the later rounds for you know not just him, but all guys kind of in that same ilk of of a player. Uh, it's really unique and special. So I hated that they kind of nullified the return game really you didn't really need you just needed somebody that could catch the ball that's it and that's all they've been doing over here for a while just content to do that. well some of them uh well they've been trying (laughs) to catch the ball uh let's try to catch some calls you you act like that's easy (laughs) larry in mount juliet wants to discuss these kickoff rules hello larry hey guys how's it going good what's going on yeah i just i was basically just calling uh wondering what what the new kickoff might look like i wasn't very aware of uh how they did it in that other league so i was just basically Mm -hmm. calling and you know trying to find out what how the rules would change on you guys have covered it pretty well here in the last 10 minutes or so and i'd also like to say that uh i've lived down here for about eight years uh big titans fan now uh former rams fan back to st louis but i'm a I'm a modder from Southern Illinois University. I'm a Saluki. Oh, Saluki, um, yeah. But I'm, but I'm a Illini fan I'm, for many, many, many years, and i just like to say, you might, you guys will probably hate to hear this, but any time Bruce Pearl goes down, it's a good day in Illinois. Oh. Yeah. And that goes back to something that happened years ago, and you guys, you know, you'll have to look at all of what, what he tried to do when he was an assistant coach at Iowa. But anyway, uh, oh, you yeah. know, go Illini, go Tennessee, and uh, – you know, you guys have a great day. Thank Appreciate you, Larry. It, yeah. I've got Illinois in my Elite Eight. Mm. Uh, this, this, it, let's. I don't think I have anybody left but Tennessee. Real quick. <laughs> the kicker would continue to kick from the 35 yard line. The other 10 players would line up at the receiving team's 40 yard line. At least nine members of the return team would line up in a setup zone between the 35 and the 30. Uh, up to two returners can line up in a landing zone between the goal line and the 20. No one other than the kicker and the returners can move until the ball hits the ground or hits a player inside the landing zone. Touchbacks would be marked at the 30-yard line, and no fair catches would be allowed. Ooh, no fair catches. I like that. No fair catches. You're, you're forcing them to return. Yep. Ooh, wow, that's uh, interesting. So that'll be a strategy there to not kick it out of the end zone. Even if you have a kicker, they can. Yep. Better watch out now. Uh, Ron in Lebanon. 
hip drop tackle talk. What's up, Ron? What's happening today? Hey, I hope everybody's doing well. Um, I I was uh I was kind of concerned with where this might go to from here, and and when you start crunching numbers and saying, well, there was this amount of tackles that that this happened and this many people got hurt. I've tried to put the relation to something that I've seen over the years of being a Titans fan and being in the stadium and watching Derrick Henry play. And I was just wondering, uh, Blaine might, would probably be able to help with this as a defensive specialist, but uh, when uh, Derrick Henry, if we, could, if we could add up how many times Derrick Henry has given a stiff arm mm-hmm. and a player has not got physically hurt but has got his pride hurt, <laughs> now, now do we consider now we're hurting players' feelings and now we've got a whole new category where we're going to have to address maybe the stiff arm or – or maybe just players getting their feelings hurt. I, I don't know. Where, where are we going with oh, this? Man. They'll never address the straight arm for sure. Anything that's offensive is never going to be addressed. Let's let's get that clear out the way. So, uh, you know, and a lot of it's smart strategic by the NFL, by the way, uh, just to get more eyeballs because people want to see offense. They want to mm-hmm. be entertained. Uh, so that's why the rules are going, let alone in their mind, and most of the rules are true that they are making the game safer. So, a little more difficult to play defense. And I think what's happening is all the kids who are wanting to play football now all go to the offensive side of the ball. So what I'm going to tell everybody is go to the defensive side of the ball because you have a better shot. It'll be less competition because everybody, when you go to the DB and wide receiver line, say, who wants to play DB? Who wants to play wide receiver or linebacker to running back? Everybody runs to the other side for the offense. And it's like three people for defense Mm -hmm. at those positions. So, uh yeah, if you got any world of talent, start practicing all those defensive stuff, man, because they, everybody wants to play offense. That's why I tell people to play bass. Everybody wants to play guitar. guitar. Be the bass player. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, exactly all right. the same analogy, Greg. Right there with you, man. Uh, Jackie, right quick, about 30 seconds left. Jackie, what you got about Joey Logano's gloves? What's up, guys? Uh, the gloves were a competitive advantage because he would stick his hand out his driver's side window while he was going down the straightaway, and it would deflect the air going down the side of his car off the rear spoiler. Less drag equals going faster. Ooh. Whoa, 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 whoa. So just his hand, you're telling me, really impacted his car and how it drove? Yeah, if you're going 190 wow. miles an hour down a straightaway, man, and you stick yeah. your hand out, just when you're doing 60, it pushes your hand around, right? Uh-huh. Imagine. And you've got that spoiler sticking up, and all that air is wrapping around the, the rear of the window going across the deck lid onto the spoiler. So if you can just let that pass and it doesn't hit that spoiler as much, Ooh. less drag equals going faster. Wow. Man, no, nobody wow. can creatively cheat like NASCAR, yeah. right, Jackie? Man, that is phenomenal. Yeah, right I mean, all the cars are the same, so these guys are having to find, like, the most creative ways to get any kind of advantage. Got yeah. you. Well, well, there you go. Good uh, job, man. Appreciate it. Thank Thanks. you, Jackie. Yeah, man. Boy, he educated me on I had no idea. I was like, Willie, I didn't imagine going 150. <laughs> yeah, yeah, much less 190. Oh, All right. We've been going 190 for two hours, though, but it's time to stick hey, our gloves done. out the window right. and deflect this thing to 3HL because they're coming up next. Yep. So in the meantime. In between time. Peace. peace.